Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is December 30th, 2009, and my guest is Thomas Rustici of George Mason University and author of Lessons for the Great Depression, the Economic Effects of the Smoot-Hawley Act of 1930 and the Beginning of the Great Depression. Tom, welcome to Econ Talk. Well, thank you. Thank you, Russ. Our topic today is the Smoot-Hawley Tariff, a tariff that's been dismissed by many as having any role in the Great Depression. Others have emphasized it. Uh, we're going to get to your take on it, which is, I think, quite interesting and different. But to get there, I want to take a slightly roundabout path and talk first about the Keynesian theory of the business cycle and, and economic growth. So in the Keynesian model, what is the cause of downturns and recessions, depressions? In, in, the, in the simple kind of Keynesian model, what we have is um, a lack of aggregate demand, total spending – um, usually uh, arises from uh, an increase in the demand to hold money. Uh, people uh, panic, start holding cash, hoarding cash. Uh, they don't spend. And in that model, spending is what creates income. It's, it's uh, designed that way, where the entire um, size of the real economy is determined by the total demand from investors, consumers, government spending, foreign trade, and so forth. So it's a demand-driven model. Uh, what's often called an overproduction under consumption model, which is a very mercantilistic model. It's kind of a pre-classical view of the world uh, with a little more sophistication, a little more algebra. What, what, do, you, what, is that, what do you mean overproduction under consumption? Well, that, that the output of the economy is uh, given, so to speak. Um, the fact is, is that it's demand that is the defining uh, limit for how big the economy actually is. So you want to think of aggregate supplies just there. It's just a given. And so if we, the argument goes that if we produce but we don't consume it, right, then uh, we enter a downturn. So everything in that Keynesian model is, is a spending model, uh, that spending is what drives the actual size of the real economy. Um, and, uh, and Keynesians, uh, their policies advocate just that. Everything is to stimulate uh, consumers to spend, investors to spend, government to spend. Making up the gap if Making consumers get gap. spooked. That's right. So in that, that uh, hoarding of money, anxiety on the part of consumers, does Keynes or his followers talk about what causes that? And Keynes uses the phrase animal spirits. Mm -hmm as a way to capture the uncertainty about people's feelings about the future, right? So is, is that just exogenous? The yeah, the volatility of money demand is going to drive their system uh, in so many ways. And, uh, yeah, it's just that, that people uh, become fearful. There's certain expectational fears of the future. Uh, they're fearful they'll lose their job or they're, well, they, they're, do lose their they, job. they do lose their job. <laughs> Therefore, they start holding back. They don't spend uh, the money just accumulates uh, and is not actually circulating uh, in exchange, uh, and therefore uh, this shrinks the real economy. Because in that Keynesian system, of course, they have the price level is given. It's, it's, uh, it's parametric. It's given. And so if prices don't adapt to this shift of aggregate demand, then quantities have to adapt. And the whole Keynesian system is just about quantities adapting, not prices adapting. And it's justified so, historically by Keynesians as a, the prices are sticky downward or rigid, wages are sticky downward. That's going to cause that's right. unemployment in the labor market as a result. Um, and it, just as an, an aside, a, another important point here, and I, and I go through this in my book on the first chapter on Keynes uh, as well as other theories of depression. The Keynesians have a view of the monetary money supply uh, itself is an endogenous variable. Uh, in other words, that money supply adapts to money demand. So everything is, again, a demand-driven model. Uh, people want to hoard money. Um, 
uh, they'll produce output, but they don't consume it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, so let's talk about something we've we've touched on here before on the program, which is the paradox of thrift. So give me your take on the paradox of thrift. The the Keynesian yeah. argument here, Keynes uh, brings up this paradox of thrift uh, in in the general theory is this notion that somehow if we if if people save in the aggregate uh that people are poorer the classicals viewed the world as if you saved and by classicals you mean the, the pre-keynesians the pre-keynesians everything up to about 1920 1930 the view was if you saved if people saved and did not spend for current consumption then that money went into the banks the banks loaned it out for productive investment capital accumulation this increased productivity, real wages, higher standard of living. So the argument seems pretty good. It seems straightforward, right? And so that was the classical pre-Keynesian view of the world that savings was beneficial to productivity, real income, uh, and the supply of goods and services in the economy. That we were all better off if we could consume less in the present and invest more for the future. Keynes comes around, of course, and everything Keynes does turns the world on its head. It's the exact opposite. With the paradox of thrift, he argues that if we all save and we try to save more, uh, that that savings will leave the flow of spending. That the money goes in the bank, bank doesn't lend it back out. So because in other words, it's people, hoarded. It's like in a mattress. It's uh, it, it leaves the circuit of transactions, so to speak. And so you can think of savings in the Keynesian models like a black hole. Things go in, nothing comes out. And therefore, that puts pressure to contract the whole real economy. So in his, in his worldview, if people save, it doesn't lead to capital accumulation. It leads to reduction of real income because people then are not spending. And so then the real economy shrinks to that level of spending that is left. And therefore, his argument is the contradiction that if in the classical world we all save, we're all wealthier because we have more flow of real goods and services. Uh, in his worldview, if we all save more, we're all poorer because we're not spending. Now, to give Keynes his due, uh, he wrote the general theory – I don't know when he wrote it. It came out in 1936. Yeah. And that was a time when there wasn't a lot of investing and mm -hmm. certainly we're in a time right now where extra savings that get put in a bank, the banks aren't so anxious to lend right. and there aren't so many people willing to take risk and borrow. Yeah. Um, so the standard uh, – the classical model would say, well, if there's this increase in, supp in supply savings for, for whatever reason, that interest rates will fall. That will make some in investments more attractive that once were unattractive, but now that the interest rates lower, that will become – borrowing the money to finance a new investment now is going to be more attractive, and that should cause this equilibrating effect, and that's going to be good. We're going to get more productive stuff brought online. But, of course, in a downturn, if you're in the middle of the downturn, not in healthy, normal times, that money can just sit in the bank. So that there are times when that Keynesian uh, worry about savings could be correct or no. What do you think? Well, um, I would argue that the Keynesian model, I mean, I, 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 you can understand its logic if you see a price system that is broken – and in fact, that's exactly what he's doing. He's doing a macro with no micro price system. And the reality is, is that um, that money going into the banks and consumers not spending this, but investors spending it, it's just shifting around who's doing the spending. The black hole argument that the money goes in, it becomes excess reserves of the banks. Uh, borrowers are not borrowing it because they're fearful. If they borrow it, they can't repay it and so forth. Uh, is an empirical question. It's an empirical question. When we look at where this notion that the interest rate does not equilibrate savers and investors, if we're making an empirical proposition that one of the most critical parts of the price system, uh, financial intermediation and that interest rate that emerges between borrowers and savers, if we're arguing that does not function, then we have to ask the question why. Okay, and I'm going to hold you off there, but I want to talk... Just for another minute, a background about the intermediation, which is, mm -hmm. um, I think, just a fancy word for the fact that when people are willing to postpone consumption, which we call savings, mm 
and there are other people who want to invest and have access to more money than they currently have, which is to borrow, there is a information problem. As a lender, as somebody maybe who has some extra money, is willing to forego consumption if I'm compensated enough through interest, as, as a lender, I need to find those folks who want to borrow. And we've had a nice uh, show on here with Mike Munger on middlemen. A bank is just a middleman. A bank or a middle thing, whatever you want to call it. It's not a person, but a bank's an intermediary that links the lenders to the borrowers in a way that and takes a cut for its own uh, play in the in this in this transaction and for the risk that it assumes because it's comparative it, advantage and yeah and it specializes brokering. obviously in the brokering in this activity. So when you're saying that that if interest rates aren't doing their job. Something might be wrong with the banking system, that's correct. and that's maybe what we ought to, we ought to look at because it's clear that at certain times um, what we would normally see as the impact of an increase in savings is not what we would always see if the economy is, is not doing well. Is that's, that fair? That's, that's, that's a good way of putting it, yeah. The, the, the banks are those brokers, those middlemen. They coordinate the savers and the borrowers and their values uh, for that capital through time. The, the the problem the problem with that Keynesian model is is that it is uh, written in such a way the original Keynesian thirty six uh, general theory uh, what Keynes is observing is institutional collapse and not giving proper uh, weight and criticism on the policies that structured those institutions the price system doesn't have inherent flaws that make it fail. Uh, there are there are the laws of supply and demand and the competitive process, short of public goods types arguments or kind of negative externality arguments. The price system, uh, based on incentives of uh, savers and borrowers, respond unless you're in institutional collapse. Uh, we know that at higher rates of interest, savers are willing to save more because they get rewarded more. Uh, if I give you 5% return on your money over a year in real terms, adjusted for inflation, you might save $100. If I offer you 50% rate of return in real return, you might save uh, you know half of your income, maybe uh, $20,000 get that return. So we know savers respond. We also know at higher interest rates, borrowers do not want to borrow. It's more costly, and at lower rates, they're encouraged to. So then the question is if that supply and demand for loanable funds through the bank setting that interest rate are not – responding in the way that incentives and a normally functioning institution would operate under competitive forces, then we have to ask, what are the policy questions, why that would not be that case? And Keynes never does this. This is his big mistake. hes uh, I would like to say he's not an empiricist in this regard. It's a pure theory without much evidence underneath it. Um, the fact is, is that you can see where money demand often will increase, where people will hoard money. Uh, you can see institutional collapse where money goes into banks but doesn't get lent out, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Well, why later. do you call that? I'm, we're gonna, I know we're going to come to that, but why do you call that institutional collapse if there is, um, as as right now in America, uh, we're we're taping this at the very end of 2009, and it should air the first week or so of 2010, and right now there's a lot of uncertainty about the future. It's not. If, if I had a great idea, and I don't, but if I did have a great idea for a new business, this wouldn't be the, the week or month I'd want to roll the dice on my family's future and borrow a large sum of money and stake it on my idea. I'd wait, right? That would be, that'd be totally rational. That wouldn't require an institutional mm-hmm. collapse. And I don't mm-hmm. care how cheap money is right. because either people are saving it or the Fed's doing X, Y, or Z or the, the – uh, Whatever else is going on in credit markets, I'm just nervous. The real empirical question is that volatility of money demand under normal and abnormal circumstances. Keynes will see nor- he, he will think the abnormal circumstances is the normal condition of economic life. We can talk about the current monetary uh, crisis that we're in. Actually, it's a financial institutional crisis. And then again, it's it's a very similar thing. Uh, I would argue we are also at the the edge of institutional collapse again, yeah, where, those, bit, where those systems lock up, and they lock up precisely for public policy that has encouraged them to lock up. 
uh, by absorbing enormous volumes of risks, anything way beyond what a free market would dictate. Okay, well, let's 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 hold off. various policies. I, I hope we'll come we'll to that at the end. Let, let's turn. Let's yeah. go back to the Great it's, Depression, though. Yeah. Um, and it's very close parallels between the Great Depression. I and understand. Today. And we'll, yeah. we'll bring, I hope we can come full circle. Sure. But I want to hear uh, what you think of as the institutional collapse of the 30s and what Smoot-Hawley had to do with that, which seems – well, I, let's, let me say it differently. The standard view of Smoot-Hawley – now, Smoot-Hawley was a tariff act passed in 1930, mm-hmm. which uh, set off a round of reciprocal tariff increases by our trading partners, and that, of course, discouraged economic trade between the U.S. and the rest of the world. It was passed for uh, various political reasons, but certainly on the surface, it had an attractiveness to the general citizen that that protectionism always has, which is let's keep out their stuff, and that way people will buy more of our stuff. And through a Keynesian argument of aggregate demand, people will – this will keep our factories going, whereas if people are buying the foreign stuff – then our factories are going to close down. We're going to get this spiral of contraction, et cetera. So the standard view of Smoot-Hawley, as I understand it, and as you talk about it in your book, is, well, in 1930, trade just was not – it wasn't nearly as important in the American economy as it is today in percentage terms. It, it was something on the order of what? About 7%. 7% so of the U.S. To, economy? 5 to 7%. So if zone. you pass a tariff and that right. number falls, it's not going to fall to zero. We didn't, it was right. not a, a pure uh, uh, a protectionism to, to cut off trade. It just reduced it dramatically. But So that number fell. It really couldn't from 7 to whatever it, it fell to. It, it just can't have the magnitude that would be necessary to explain anything remotely close to the contraction – in the economic system that we saw in the 30s, which was more on the order of? 36% decline from 1929 to 33. So there's no way that a reduction in trade when the U.S. was relatively uh, unglobal compared to today, there's just, and certainly small in absolute terms, there's just no way that 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 protectionism could have had an important role. So uh, it's been dismissed as a, by most economists as an important contributor to the depression. You take a different approach and, and on the surface it, it seems you can't quip, you can't really argue with that argument, but you're gonna argue with it. So tell tell us why. There there are many problems uh, with the the way we model this tariff today, and partly because of that Keynesian influence. I mean we, we model the economy as the C plus I plus G plus X. Uh, minus and, M. Yeah minus M. And say say what those are. That's the consumption spending, investment spending, government spending, and exports minus imports. And and therefore, when you add that up, you say, okay, that's 100% of total spending. And certainly, you can take the total amount of spending and parse it between consumers, investors, government, and net net exports. Right, right. So so most most, uh, modern economists, you are correct, uh, basically will argue – Economic historians will argue that it was a, a negative policy. It certainly reduced the economy, but it wasn't nowhere near the magnitudes. Therefore, uh, it's kind of a sideshow. It's an a unfortunate policy, so to speak. And free marketers who like to complain about tariffs, they've exaggerated, yeah, exaggerated. its impact. This is the argument. Now, what is interesting is at the time it was passing, most of the world's economists, uh, monetary economists uh, and, and non-monetary economists, Gave it a central role in the Great Depression, so and they certainly opposed the tariff very they, they, vociferously. Yeah, yeah, and they argued that this was vastly, vastly uh, destructive. And so then the question that I set out to ask, answer is this: is why did the economics profession seventy, eighty years ago uh, have such a unified and 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 uh, very uh, loud voice with this? that this was central to the entire Great Depression worldwide. And yet today, with all of our sophisticated econometrics and modeling techniques and so forth, uh, we're trivializing it away as just this little sideshow. 
Well, that's because economists then didn't know very much, and we're smarter now. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We could do that would do be the standard. Yeah. That'd be easy to, ex- yeah. to explain that difference. See, see, my argument is that the economists at the time actually were, of course, this was pre-Keynesian times, um, and actually uh, saw these things a lot more integrated than these little compartmentalized aggregate spending components. That they actually being there and living through it and seeing it realized there were much more effects than can. Uh, be quantitatively measured in any kind of uh, uh, macro model and and uh, and so forth. What I have tried to do with this is to go back and ask this question. And then again, this 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 crosses the uh, intellectual spectrum. Whether you're talking about Keynesians or even new classicals like Robert Lucas, who basically argued it was bad but sideshow, trivial, not the main story. That the main story by economic historians today, predominantly is the monetary story, which comes from uh, Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz. Uh, Most economic historians, the overwhelming majority of them, accept the monetary hypothesis that the institutional collapse of 10,421 banks in a period of three years destroyed... Out of roughly how many? um, Out of uh, 25,000. It was 40% decline in the number of banks... The money supply declined 29% in a period of three years. It was a catastrophic collapse of the money supply uh, of the banking system. 40% all the banks collapsed uh, in a period of three years. Um, and then that was uh, the main story. And, and I don't dispute that. Uh, this is the point that I, I, I try to make, that I'm not trying to say that 36% decline in the real GDP was caused just because of a tariff that it had different channeling mechanisms, that we have this tendency today to do one of two mistakes when we look at this. Uh, We do what I call a a macro uh, dissipation effect or a micro trivialization effect, and let me explain these. If you look at the water in the Panama Canal, it's a small amount of ocean water. It's a very, very small amount compared to the vastness of the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. Now, if you look at a broad map of the oceans and the water in those oceans and the water in the Panama Canal, one might infer that the volume of world trade that occurs over that ocean water in the canal has to be small because it's a small amount of water relative to all of this ocean In water. the Panama Canal. In the Panama Canal because it's only maybe a billionth of a percent. The of Panama the total can't water. be an important. It can't, that can't be important to the uh, overall, world trade because it's world such trade a small over ocean water and so forth. Going now, all over the place. Because look at all that other water out there. Right. And, but we know that's not true. We know a large amount does go through that canal. So it's very critical water at that point, at that point of juncture. And so we have a tendency when we're doing this big macro modeling of the effects of Smoot-Hawley to dissipate it into the background and say this is just a little small thing relative to all this other stuff. Conversely, when we do our micro-modeling of it and we look at the uh, Harburger Triangles, the deadweight losses that occur from this would tariffs. Be, this would be losses of people not pursuing are, the comparative advantage. Artificially and, being induced to buy the more expensive product, the U.S. Right. devoting more resources to steal than it needs to right, because of the it's inefficiently reciprocal. Inefficiently produced yeah. because of the higher price by the tariff. Uh, the problem with that is, is we get into a compartmentalization where we hermetically seal off the effects of that tariff to other institutions. And so my hypothesis, I originally uh, came from two monetary economists. One was, of course, uh, Larry White uh, on the monetary side of the equation. And another was uh, Alan Meltzer at Carnegie Mellon, who in his uh, article in 1976 in the Journal of Monetary Economics pointed out that Smoot-Hawley may have had a a, a very significant monetary effect, uh, which could have been a triggering mechanism to make that depression much worse than anything else we've seen. Strange channel, not obvious. It's not an obvious channel. Trade. We usually think of trade being a very, as you say, a micro typically a micro phenomenon, or as you say, an aggregate macro. But when we think about it through the monetary channel, what would be the connection between higher prices for steel or one good or another that U.S. Uh, maybe shouldn't be doing as much of? Why would that have monetary implications? Right. Well, what I, I try to do in my book is to go through and ask the question. I, I first start with the proposition – 
uh, that I do think the monetary implosion, uh, the collapse of the banking system, the collapse of the money supply, the financial disintermediation that occurred in 1929 to 33 is the main culprit of why that was not a normal downturn. It was a catastrophic downturn. My question was what caused that that collapse. Now, the the uh, the authorities uh, I, I I would cite here, of course, is uh, Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz. Uh, they were the first in their monetary history of the United States to uh, point out that the proximate cause of that downturn was the Federal Reserve and allowing a series of bank runs over a period of four years where people panicked, took their money out of banks, and the Federal Reserve did not provide liquidity to those banks. Because our banking system is a fractional reserve system, and therefore only a fraction of the deposits are ever in the bank. At any one time. At any one time. And we have a credit structure based on that fractional reserve. And therefore, small changes in base money at the base have massive effects for money and credit throughout the entire structure of the economy. And if the Fed behaves properly and wisely, there shouldn't be a problem. If the Fed does not respond properly or responds negatively or doesn't respond in a time of a financial crisis, uh, then the entire system can implode. So not only can you have runaway inflation under a fractional reserve very easily, you can have runaway deflation, what's called a secondary deflation where the credit structure implodes as people pull their money out of the banks to carry around with them because they don't trust the solvency of the banks. So going through monetary history, I looked at the question of where were the first bank runs? Where were the first banks that collapsed uh, in 1929-30? Where was the where was the pattern of that? Where, what what was the conditions, the micro under uh, economic conditions here? We had the stock market crash in October of nineteen twenty nine. That's so right. So that's that precedes Smoot Hawley. Right. Smoot Hawley well, passes when? Well, actually, the legislative history of Smoot Hawley. If we go go back a little further, Herbert Hoover was elected on a a, pro, a promise to impose tariffs to protect the farmers in America. But America at this time was exporting about half of its farm, uh, half of its export income came from farm sector. So we were the world's largest exporter of agricultural goods around the world. As we still are today. Yeah. And so, so actually tariffs would hurt farmers, not help them. But nevertheless, he ran on a platform to help the American farmer with tariffs. And in uh, April, uh, in uh, March and April of 1929, right after he was uh, inaugurated, uh, the uh, the tariff uh, was going through the house, and it started expanding not just to farm goods but to other goods. And by the fall of 1929, the house had already passed Moot Hawley. Um, the house was very protectionist at this time, and it expanded to virtually everything, uh, extremely high rates. And the Senate at this time was more free trade. Uh, there were 16 free trade senators that were basically blocking Smoot Hawley in the Senate. And then in October, specifically the date is October 21st, uh, 1929, uh, the 16 uh, free trade senators basically log rolled and said, we'll join in if you give tariffs for our states, for our industries. And the Senate then supported the Smoot-Hawley bill, which had been blocked because the House bill and the Senate bill uh, were a different. The Senate wanted more free trade. The House was more protectionist. What kind of magnitudes are we talking about in tariff increases? From 38% average dutable tariff to 60%. It's almost a so doubling. It's a huge, it's a huge increase in tariffs. Um, and, and, of course, there was immediate uh, ramifications. The day the Senate, uh, the, the 16 free trade senators switched and the Senate passed Moot Hawley. Which was, was again the, in October? October 21st, 1920. Okay. That's when the actual market began its slide. Um, and uh, by October 21st, October 29th, the market lost about a third of its value, a little more than a third of its value uh, during this time. You're saying before the crash? This is before the crash. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's before the crash. Now, what is interesting is that when you read the financial papers, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, uh, they have the same things on the same front page, you know, market decline, 
Uh, and then on the other side of the page, tariff passes the Senate, you know, and nobody connecting the dots, right? Like, like, like these don't have something to do with each other. And the reason they do have something to do with each other, of course, is that what's happening on the capital markets is that speculators are acquiring future information and they're processing this. And of course, here you have a tariff. You have the world's largest economy taking a hugely protectionist stand and traders all around the world are seeing this. They, they can anticipate this train that's coming right at them. And we would expect this to hit not only um, our export uh, companies, companies like our automotive companies, our uh, radio companies uh, that made radios and electronics and so forth, had a huge export market. We were supplying most of the world with uh, their stuff. You would expect their prices to collapse. That's exactly what you expect. And you would expect on the commodities market for the agricultural, the grains, you know, uh, cotton, wheat, uh, corn, anything we're exporting in the world export market, that also to collapse. Why? And that day it did. All of them crashed uh, on October 21st. The reason for that is, of course, we put up tariffs to the rest of the world's goods. Meaning the rest of the that w- if they come in with their – any imports are now going to have have to have a higher price – to absorb this, uh, essentially a tax, tax that's going to have to be paid by the right, the ex- right by the importer. Their foreign governments retaliated, and they threatened very early. In fact, in 1929, as Smoot Hawley was going through the House and then the Senate, uh, a lot of countries started preemptive strikes on us. They said, "Wow, we're targeted, uh, Spain and others." So we're being targeted with tariffs, and their politicians in their home countries raised tariffs to American goods. And and we saw where this was going. It was always the hope that the Senate would not pass this, but then the Senate did in October 21st uh, of uh, 1929. So speculators all around the world saw this, and they saw this impending tariff war, not just with the rest of the world in the United States, but these tariff wars have a tendency to proliferate. So it's not just Spain against America, it's Spain against France and Italy and Britain. And, and, and that's exactly what, the, what ended up unfolding. Um, so we saw the fact that foreign governments that were, foreign uh, buyers, that were buying about 30% of our wheat and corn and cotton and so forth, basically put up tariffs to our goods. And they start buying their corn and wheat and cotton from other countries, Canada, Australia, other places. And, uh, and we would expect those commodity prices to collapse. They did. They did. And in doing so, the farmers that were dependent on that export market were also hit. So you not only get the capital market on all of our foreign uh, uh, products, primarily electronics, steel, um, uh, automo- automotive uh, uh, industry, to take a, a severe hit with that uh, tariff. And it did in the in the in the stock market crash. But the price the price collapse isn't what's imp- what's really important is the quantity side. It's going to be a lot less economic activity. It's going to be a right. lot less corn and and cotton sold to the rest of the world. More available here, more which available push here, the price which down, push that price down. But but not as not as much total. The total the amount of economic well, activity is going to shrink. What also in what, those areas? Yeah, that's right. That's right. What what is also interesting is that what happened after the stock market crash. Now, I go in my book, I have a whole chapter on the causes of the stock market crash, what are the different com- contributory factors and so forth, uh, Smoot-Hawley plus all the, the other various factors. We also know that the Federal Reserve uh, in uh, the fall of 1929 uh, raised interest rates relatively dramatically. They had started in uh, late 1928 raising it. The discount rate was 3.5%. They raised it to 6% uh, by September of 1929. Um, and uh, this, of Thinking course, slows, slows down the economy. They were deliberately trying to squelch what they considered stock market speculation, which was absolutely crazy because the market was not overvalued by any any financial criteria we can point to. And I go through that literature to point this out, that the market was not overvalued. It's ironic um, because, of course, today's world, people are complaining yeah, right. uh, that, that the Fed now needs to start popping bubbles where we're in housing yeah, right. or other speculative same, areas. Same, same stuff here. So, so you have a monetary contraction beginning by this uh, discount rate of the Fed uh, in late 28, early 1929, slows the economy down. You get this tariff hitting. 
And commodities traders and uh, investment traders on Wall Street sitting there looking at this, and they realize we're heading into a downturn. And, and of course, we were. We actually started the, the depression, actually started uh, at the beginning of the third quarter, 1929, which is August, the end of July, somewhere in July, August is when it begins. And uh, what is fascinating is what happened after the stock market crash, because the Senate bill and the House bill on Smoot-Hawley were different bills. And they tried to reconcile those bills in November and December through conference, reconciliation. The Senate and the House couldn't agree on reconciliation. So it looked like the bill was dead. And in fact, the New York Times even proclaimed smoot Ali tariff is now dead and what, in what, that session of Congress that there was no way they can reconcile which these is bills. When late, which is when? Late uh, 29? It's 1929, November, December, the end of November, early December. What is fascinating is the stock market, which had lost uh, uh, more than a third of its value in that one week in October, uh, gradually starts to, to come back. And in fact, smoot Hawley isn't legislatively passed, where it's actually a, a bill uh -huh. to be signed by Hoover until June of 1930. So what happens is it dies at the end of November 1929. Then when, they, when Congress meets in session again in January, they start working on reconciliation of that bill from the prior session. And so through the spring, a whole bunch of compromises were made uh, in the tariff schedules to get, to get the reconciliation. And so March, April, May, June, um, we had seen the stock market come back and it had regained uh, most of its value. It was only 8% below where it was at the beginning of 1929. When all of these compromises came came through in in the in the fall, I mean in the spring, 1920, uh, 1930, and that's when all the retaliation started hitting in that spring. As we started this reconciliation, uh, thirty six countries lodged fifty nine formal protests with State Department. A whole variety, dozens of countries had already started raising tariffs to us, and in May fifth, nineteen thirty. 1,028 professors of economics, professional economists from the American Economic Association signed a petition to Herbert Hoover, said do not sign this bill, that if they get this thing through, uh, this thing will uh, basically send a recession into a depression and it will be worldwide. This will be catastrophic. And they also made this point that this will have monetary effects in that letter. Which one, we're getting to for those who are listening 1, at home. One thousand and twenty-eight. <laughs> one thousand twenty-eight. You know, if you can find a thousand twenty-eight economists today to agree on something, decide that's a, that's a lot. Oh, so, but there this, weren't as many. By there, the was, way. there wasn't that many back then. Yeah, right. today there's I think maybe ten thousand. Right. Twenty thousand. I mean, this is like the economists. entire profession. Yeah. And uh, they sent the letter to to Hoover, and uh, in June, uh, the final bill went to Hoover on uh, June I think fourteenth. I want to say. And on that following uh, Monday, he signed the bill. He said, promises made shall be promises kept. That's what he probably ran for. And uh, as a protectionist, he, he didn't like all the tariff rates. He thought some were way too high, but he said, this is what we're going to work with. And the day he signed that bill, the stock market took a massive collapse. It actually started when the House and Senate came up with the exact same bill, and it passed. And in the first two weeks of June... Leading up to his signing and after signing, the stock market lost 23% of its value. So what had happened was we had this, this, uh, this hit in October, kind of forewarning what is to come. It regained most of its value, about 85% of its value came back. Uh, and then by the spring, you start to see politics push this tariff forward, and then you see it lose all of its gains again. It just collapsed again. Second biggest drop in the history of the stock but market. But that's just the stock market, which is a stock, barometer. Which is, right? you know, it's a barometer. People, people tend also, to think it's got its own causal uh, effects, and it has some, of course, but but right now you're just talking about it as a barometer. It's of, just a barometer. These are these speculators. Were, and so when you look at what happened to stock markets, it wasn't just in America. Uh, in my book, I point out that in 10 different countries at the exact same time, you have this massive collapse of stock prices. Uh, all around the world, all of our trading partners, whether it's in England or Germany or Italy or France, massive collapse in their stock values. So what that's telling you is there's something worldwide going on. There's something worldwide going on uh, that's crossing it. It can't be just some speculatory bubble in one country 
uh, because it would have been in all 10 simultaneously. There had to have been something systemic in the world economy that was going to come down. And, uh, and my, my point is, is that the economists at this time realized that trade had monetary effects. Okay, so let's turn to that. So yeah. we still have this issue. Okay, so we're going to be less efficient as an economy with, with tariffs. We're going to do more for ourselves, less trade. Every other nation who's trading with this is dealing with the same thing with these countervailing tariffs that they put on. But that would just cause less efficient economy normally. You'd say, well, that's just going to mean we're going to three percent. We're going to shrink yeah. a little bit. But they, you argue, they miss something. Right. If you have a let's say a two percent loss of gross national product, that sounds like everything in block moves down two percent. That's not the way economies are. Uh, they're the aggregation of all the regional and individual economies. And the reality is, is if you have a 2% loss in your real economy, but it's showing up in five or 10 states. That is catastrophic for those states. You see, we have this, because of the way we do our model, modern modeling, we tend to think everything is in unison. Everything is not in unison. And there are distributional patterns to those losses. And the fact is, is that when you take two or three uh, billion dollars of real income out of five or 10 states at this time, that is catastrophic. Take it across the whole economy, yeah, we, we, we go into a recession and we're all a little poorer. Do it in five or ten states and you, you have something on the order of 10 to 15 percent drops in, those in real income in those states. So then the question was, what are those states? Who is dependent on foreign export market? So I went back to Friedman and Schwartz and I looked at where those bank failures started to occur. And they make the point that the first bank runs, uh, the very first catastrophic bank runs, occur in November and December of 1930. November and December. And they occur in six Midwest farm states, uh, like uh, Iowa, Missouri, uh, Arkansas, Indiana, Illinois, uh, the agricultural export markets. And, and of course, I went, act, went back and actually looked at real income, personal income in those states for farmers and so forth. And you see this, this huge, massive drop uh, in farm income. The reality is, is that uh, in November and December, you had a total in those two months of 600 s- banks fail in two months. But as you say, it wasn't 600 divided by 50, which would be 12 right. banks it, it per wasn't, state. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't sta- nationwide. We had 50 states? We had, we had 48 states. Okay. states. I, mean, I knew there was. Yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah. we'll go around that. We'll yeah. just yeah. to say 12, so, so, 12 so, banks per state. So you they, were, at, they were concentrated. Right. You had, you had uh, in November, you had like 250-something banks go down. Then in December, you had 300 and like 60 banks go down in those states. The one big bank, these were farm banks, rural banks, and so forth, which would, would be tied directly to the agriculture sector. The one big bank that went down was the Bank of the United States, and that was in New York. And that was the sixth largest bank in America. And that had its own unique significance. Um, symbolic by its name. Very symbolic by its name. Um, very, very kind of a unique thing where the, all the rest of these banks uh, were starting uh, to fail in the Midwest. When you look at the years, 1920 to 1929, we had an average of about 600 banks per year nationwide close their doors. About 50 per month average. These were small farm banks generally spread all across America, all the states. Now you get 600 in two months. um, And you get this one huge, massive bank in New York go down. and this is the beginning of something that's going to be very, very huge. Uh, in 1931, we get more bank runs in the, uh, in the spring and in the summer and in the fall. We get a whole nother series of bank runs uh, where hundreds and hundreds of banks go down. So in the year 1930, uh, well over 1,300 banks go down. In, 30, in 31, you mean? In 1931, 31, yeah. 31. So you get 1,300 banks go down after 600 went down in the last two months. You, you suddenly realize that what's happening is something much bigger, uh, and it's primarily starting with the agricultural regions. These tend to be smaller banks. They tend to be state banks. Um, and, and what you see is over 1930, 31, 
30, uh, 31 was catastrophic worldwide because you also have a lot of bank failures in Europe. And, and here's where, where I make this point. When you look at the pattern of bank failures in America, we know where they start. They start in the south and the uh, central Midwestern United States, the Farm Belt. And they migrate north and they migrate east over the next three years. And they go from rural to cities. In Europe, you see the same pattern of bank failures that start rural, get bigger to cities, and they go country to country to country. It's a huge domino effect. Uh, we see that in 1930, 1929, the, in Austria, for example, the Bowdoin Credit Installed, which was the farm credit bank, it was the largest farm credit bank, that the country of Austria was giving subsidies to farmers through low interest loans, steering them into agricultural exports and so forth of that nature. The Bowdoin Credit Installed went bankrupt in 1929. So in 1930, the government of Austria forced them to merge with the largest bank in the country, the Credit Installed, which was the largest bank in Austria. The post-merger between the Credit Installed and the Bowdoin Credit Installed was a net negative. It was bankrupt when it reopened its doors. So in May 1931, after all of the merger, the forced merger had taken place, uh, May of 1931, the government of Austria uh, shut down the, the credit install. And, of course, then people in Germany are, like, pulling all their money out of Austria. And, of course, those bank runs will then go from uh, Austria. They also go to Hungary. The Hungarian General Credit Bank went down. It was, like, the second largest bank in Hungary. Uh, it went down. Germany, the Danit Bank, third largest bank in the country of Germany, it went down. And you start to see these bank runs and waves of bank runs occur from Eastern Europe moving to Western Europe, to France, to England over this period. And so then the question is, when you start looking at these bank runs and look at these major banks that failed, whether it's the Hungarian uh, General Credit Bank or the Bowdoin Credit Installed or these other ones, you suddenly realize they're all tied to like subsidies given to specific sectors on the world export market. It could be farm sector, uh, as it was with the Bowdoin credit installed. It could be in Hungary, where they were giving credit to uh, exporters of cotton, exporters of fabric, uh, exporters of manufactured goods. And what you start to see is that the loans, with the world tariff war emerging, <coughs> the loans made to the special interest groups in Europe, uh, below market interest rates, forced subsidies, and so forth, were not sustainable when those tariffs began to escalate. Those banks went down. And so that the, is, the, the, the farmers who systems. had borrowed the money on the basis of future profits, uh, those profits disappeared when world trade collapsed. collapsed. And as a result, they couldn't repay their loans. As a result, the banks didn't have In those assets, regions. Didn't have their cash flow that they expected. And they were very susceptible to a loss of confidence. This is exactly where the pattern begins. And you see this. And so it's not like all banks uh, suddenly, you know, uh, uniformly across the United States or across the world start to fail. It's these banks that have loans tied to people in the world export market. And that world export market shuts down. Now, then the question is, if those banks fail, what's the proper response? Now, you can do one of a couple of things. If, if, if those failures lead to contagion, where general fear of the banking system collapsing, uh, none of the European banks had deposit insurance. We didn't have deposit insurance. Most of the governments of Europe created central banks after 1920, after the war. Um, so now what is a central bank to do? It's supposed to support the base money and the inverted credit pyramid. If people are pulling their cash out of the banks out of fear they're going to lose their principal, then you have to inject liquidity to keep those banks open. If you don't, those banks come down. And that's exactly what they did. The, uh, the European banks uh, were derelict as well as our central bank was as well. So we have a. So this is the this is the well, I would describe this. We have a flawed institutional financial structure and this tariff. By, by, by this worldwide tariff retaliation, 
puts enormous pressure on those institutions domestically and internationally. And then it's a question of, okay, why aren't the central banks responding? That's a, that's a great question. And I have some discussion on this in my free banking literature of why it might be the case that a trade shock can affect the monetary institutions, and they don't even see it coming. They don't even see it coming. This time there was gross ignorance in the Federal Reserve. Uh, they, they, right in the middle of monetary collapse, they thought they had an easy money policy. At the same time, the money supply was contracting. Uh, we have a tendency to think they had the data they have today. Which they, they did have but, that data. And so this is a, really a – you could think of it as a fleshing out of the Friedman and Schwartz story to uncover the mechanism that led to the collapse of, of, uh, of the banking system. Yeah. And then the con- subsequent contraction of the money supply as a result of – the in, when you said the inverted pyramid, it's because you have a small amount of base money held supporting by the banks the supporting through the fractional reserve system, right. supporting lots of loans. And when some of those loans go bad, there's going to be this um, – how would you describe it? A, well, you create an insolvency problem for those banks. And, and an important point to note in, in this period, there's a difference between what's called illiquidity and insolvency. Ill, Ill insolvency. Insolvency. Yeah. Illiquidity is what the Fed can prevent. It's you know by having elastic currency by just you know open market operations. Lender of last there, resort. Lender of last resort. The problem was they weren't the lender of last resort. There was no lender of last resort, and 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 in a central banking system on a fractional reserve, you absolutely have to have a lender of last resort. This is why I oppose central banking. I think we should get rid of the Federal Reserve. The entire concept of central bank, I think, is structurally flawed. But nevertheless, that's That's the institutions we have. have. And and, and if you're going to have a central bank, it's got to behave like a central bank. Um, And, of course, institutionally, they they did everything backwards, everything wrong. Uh, You can imagine. uh, I mean, at one point in 1931, in the height of the bank runs, when thousands of banks had gone down, the money supply had already contracted double digits, uh, the Federal Reserve was selling uh, assets in their open market operations. They were selling assets. Pulling more, even more reserves more out, of the out of the system, which then tells you they had a very erratic view of how things were happening. Meltzer argues, Alan Meltzer argues, because they were wedded to the real bills doctrine, this kind of, you know, the credit with needs of trade type argument. Of course, that's very pro-cyclical. If the economy's in a downturn, there's not much trade going on, therefore you need to supply less currency. That's the argument. That's the argument, which would magnify the downturn. Yeah. Or, or if, the, if the economy is picking up, then we have more trade, we need more money, print more money. This is a pro-cyclical view of the world. And, and Meltzer has argued the Fed was dominated by that real bills doctrine, which I think there's some truth to that. I think there is some truth that that's probably what was guiding them. But we, get, we forget this. At the time, the Federal Reserve Board, now it's called the Board of Governors, uh, you didn't have to be an economist or even have any credentials in economics to get on that. Uh, I think three of the uh, Federal Reserve Board members had no training in economics at all. One was like a farmer. Uh, one was a former politician. One was like a used car salesman or something. I don't know what he was. But they had no background, zero background. But, and, uh, and, of course, they didn't have the data, the informational gathering right. data, to actually know where the economy was. They, they really no, had, we still have that problem. We so. still have that problem. There's, just like we have lags today, yeah, the lags were worse. vastly worse then. So let's come full circle and, and then talk about some of the implications. Well, if like, I can give you two, two examples that might highlight okay. kind of where my research went. And and where I, wanna, I think we need But to I want to make sure we get to the – back to our opening discussion of, of – Institutional collapse. Okay. When you're in a world where banks are failing because of expectations of profit not being realized as the tariff rug is being pulled out from under them, Mm -hmm. you're going to have an inability of these institutions to perform the the, um, helping lenders and borrowers get together. Right, right. Yeah, no, we'll have time for that. Go ahead. Um, let me give you just like two examples of the things I found. Uh, most, uh, a lot of my book deals with farm activity, but it also deals with industrial activity as well. Let me give you two examples. In our tariff war following Smoot-Hawley, 
we had a uh, retaliation from Canada. Now, Canada is our largest trading partner. Then? Then, yeah. And Canada had a very different monetary system. They had a much more free banking type system with no branching laws, no... Uh, no, no limits on branching. No limits yeah. on branching uh, and this kinds of stuff. Um, they had no bank failures in their, in their de- during this depression, even though over a third of their GDP came from foreign trade. So they took this massive tariff hit, a third of their economy, took the dive, but the money, the monetary system didn't dive. It absorbed that hit. Their money supply only dropped 13% over the entire period. Ours dropped 29%. They had no bank failures. We had 10,421 bank failures. Uh, in other words, their financial system didn't become an, a, an aggravating factor. Uh, a to little that more system. resilient. They also yeah, had a much, much more and, resilient. And their downturn yeah. in real output was much smaller. Yeah, it was much smaller than ours. Now, be when, some lessons to be learned from so that. So, be some lessons we to be learned this. Learn yeah, so we had this, our biggest trading partner. So, we put up tariffs to a lot of Canadian goods. And after 1930, they just they, they deliberately went after our iron and steel exports to Canada. Now, what we know is we were exporting about $200 million a year in iron and steel to Canada. After Smoot-Hawley, when the Canadian government then retaliated, specifically, not just, not just iron and steel, but that was one of their main things. They put up tariffs to $200 million of exports. Um, our exports to Canada dropped to $29 million a year. It was an 85% drop in the exports to Canada, as well as the rest of the world it, it declined as well because they put up tariffs. Canada is where we sold most of it at. When you look at the 17 months between the tariff retaliation in Canada and the decline in export of iron and steel to Canada, what we find is in the first 17 months, uh, $359 million less exports to Canada on iron and steel. Now, why do I say 17 months? Because 17 months after Smoot-Hawley, Something happens in a particular city, uh, and I'll let you guess what is the city of iron and steel. It's Pittsburgh. We know 17 months later, 11 of Pittsburgh's banks go insolvent and have to shut their doors. 11. The Pittsburgh banks had depositor losses of $69 million. That was the whole main structure of the entire banking system. So then you ask the question, you say, okay, if we're going to take... Most of that iron steel, which is coming out of Pittsburgh, most of it, not all of it, but most of it. And you take $359 million and some percentage of that out of the Pittsburgh economy, uh, this is a good reason why you might have uh, $69 million dollars of depositor losses in those 11 banks that had to shut down. This is in the first 17 months. Furthermore, furthermore if you look at the, the, the final banking crisis in the interregnum period between Roosevelt being elected in November and being inaugurated in March. That's when we still inaugurated in March, 1933. What we find is the big collapse occurred. uh, 4,000 banks went down in four months. 4,000 banks, four months. Well, there was huge. While while Hoover was uh, was still president. He was still president, but he was lame duck and and, uh, Roosevelt was waiting. The Detroit banks were the main banks that the RFC, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, was worried about. In February, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation examined the banks in Detroit, all the main banks directly tied to the auto industry. They they reviewed their balance sheets and came up with a plan, a rescue plan, which would have required about $12 million to save all of the banks tied directly to the auto industry. They went to Henry Ford and asked for seven and a half million of his money to be subordinated deposits that he wouldn't withdraw to give the cash to the banks. And then they went to the other three auto companies. It was the Hudson Motors, Chrysler, General Motors, to come up with 4.5 million. And so for about 12 million, they argued, we can stabilize the banking system in Detroit entirely. So it was $12 million. Now, when I look back at the auto exports, 
following the retaliation of Smoot Hawley. And I go through this in my book on which countries levied what tariffs and what happened to their purchases of our automobiles. The auto industry was our largest manufactured export at this time, that and, and steel. Just like planes are one of yeah. the largest today. And what we find is the the three-year cumulative loss from the time of Smoot Hawley's passage till the time of the Detroit banking crisis in January, February of 1933. During this period, uh, the the cumulative volume of and dollars of, of auto exports declined from the pre Smoot Hawley days one point five billion dollars. So 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 had had we not had those tariffs and maintained our world exports, Detroit would have seen close to a billion and a half dollars flow right into it. Um they needed $12 million to save those banks. So, so you suddenly look at this and you suddenly realize that the entire Detroit banking system tied directly to the auto industry, decimated by this law. We know every country it retaliated. We know what we were selling before. We know what those tariffs went to. And we know how they, that, uh, uh, what we had was an 85, again, another 85% reduction in sales of U.S. made automobiles. And uh, just to make a long story short on this, when Henry Ford, uh, when, they, when they couldn't get the other three auto companies put up four, four and a half million, Henry Ford then backed out and then withdrew 25 million of his own cash and put it in his own personal vault. And then, of course, that precipitates the whole collapse of that whole system. So, so when I look at this and I think, okay, we know, now, we know what happened me, in Pittsburgh, me, we know what happened in Detroit, we know what happened in the agriculture sector, we know what happened in the world market. Uh, across the world and agricultural markets and major banks around the world. The notion that Smoot Hawley was just this little trivial sideshow is totally misleading. You have to start disaggregating. You have to start looking at the micro connections because all of this inefficiency ultimately shows up in the financial system. All mistakes of investments, all investments that are not going to fulfill expectations, all end up in the solvency of those banks. And that's what we had. And we did not have uh, leaders of financial institutions, uh, of central banks, that uh, responded correctly. Even though it was an insolvency problem, they could have prevented the contagion. So not surprisingly, people don't want to use that intermediary uh, at that point in time. That's right. And this kind of gets back to that Keynes argument about the savings. and so Yeah, forth. so finish that if up. If you think about it from this angle, Keynes and the general theory – when he argues that people save not according to interest rates, but tradition. You know, he says we have these notions of tradition and kind of inertia. We just, we just kind of save because our fathers and mothers saved. Uh, that is that not, not responding, responding to price. They're not to responding to rates. price incentives. And then, of course, we invest based on animal spirits, you know, just kind of confidence, uh, confidence. Over, overconfidence or fear. Yeah, just or, kind of these psychological factors. And they really didn't have to do anything with that price and incentives. If you think about it, if you're before 1933 and there's no deposit insurance and the central bank is not acting like a lender of last resort, which would stabilize those bank runs, and you're on a fractional reserve and you have this massive exogenous hit to the entire uh, regional economies, what happens is, is if I put $100 in the bank and the interest rate on my savings is 3%, and, and someone says, okay, put it over in this bank at 7%. I have more incentive to put it in 7%. Maybe even add a few extra dollars in or get more money. But if I'm worried the bank shuts down and I'm going to lose, uh, you know, 72% of my principal, <laughs> the 7% don't matter to me. Yeah, no, that's not. It's, a, it's, it's, it's getting the security of your principal back uh, because there's no deposit insurance. And so we know depositors lost routinely uh, lots of money when they put their money in the bank. And so then the general fear of, is the bank safe? You know, we saw that, if you ever seen the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, where they're all running on the daily building and loan. Yeah. That happened for years and years and years, not just in this country, but worldwide. And and the reality is when George Bailey says, your money's not here. He's right. I loaned it to him. He's right. (laughs) He's right. And so until you can get the the flow of, of that, the payment system, such that they can get the payment from the lady to then I can then give you your money back in a time of financial panic where people are just saying, I want my money out. A dollar in my pocket is safe. A dollar in the bank, uh, 
I don't know. Uh, I know I'm going to get interest, but I don't even know if I get that. So when so, Keynes is arguing the interest rate doesn't equilibrate savings and investment, it's what's called a broken joint, all right, between savers and investors, that, the, that might make sense in a world of institutional collapse. And instead of Keynes blaming central banks, fractional reserves on those central banks with a monopoly provision of the currency and so forth, instead of blaming government policy, he blames the price system. But what we know from economics is that prices are not just these floating abstractions around there. They're connected to property. They're connected to ownership. They're connected to institutions. And so Keynes has no clue about institutions. And, and, and I would argue this is his, my biggest criticism of him. He's blaming the price systems for the failings of government. These are all government failures, the tariff, the central banking system. Uh, fractional reserves, per se, are not necessarily unstable, but a monopoly on that cent- on that fractional is. And but this is where had, free banking comes but in. But we had bank runs before the Federal Reserve existed, That's right. right? So how can you claim that the bank runs of the late 20s and early 30s were – the result of a failure of the Federal Reserve. Well, what's different here is we did have bank runs in the 20s. The bank runs... Uh, well, there was know, a Federal Reserve in the 20s. There was we, a Federal we had bank Reserve. bank runs in the 19th century. But, but the difference is the Federal Reserve policy in the 20s was very different than it was at the end of uh, beginning 29 and 30. Uh, there, the, 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 the failures tended to be state banks, which were not part of the Federal Reserve system. They tend to be smaller, less capitalized banks, um, so when you look at the bank failures from 1920 to 29, and I talk about that in the book, the, 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 these tend to be these unit banks, small unit banks, farm banks. They tend to be agricultural uh, industry as well. Um, and when you look at the total depositor losses uh, uh, through the whole entire decade of the 1920s, just to give you some example, the, 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 the yearly loss for depositors – was $62 million a year, $62 million a year on average between 1920 and 1929. Nationwide. $62 million nationwide per year. Um, you look at um, the failure of the Bank of the United States, which the Fed could have prevented. Uh, they could have prevented that loan. That one took down $200 million by itself. Uh, by itself. You look at thousands of banks going down, and the character of the bank failures changed. Instead of it being these little tiny small unit banks, by the time you get to 29, see, we had, we had about 5,000 bank failures in 10 years. About 500, 600 per year on average. And they were scattered all across the country. And there you wouldn't get the, 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 the major runs. The last major runs we had was in the panic of 1907. That was before the Federal Reserve. That's what led ostensibly to the creation of the Fed, was we had these bank panics. Right. But that was Knickerbocker Trust in New York. It was a big trust company, and J.P. Morgan saved that system. So then we created the Fed because we said we don't want to have to privately try and save the banking system. And what you find is during the 20s, you know, you had uh, the, the basically the, the, the main person at the Fed was Benjamin Strong, who never let the contagion happen. He was, uh, he was a, a fairly good Fed chairman. Um, and he wasn't under any illusion of squelching stock market speculation. He wasn't under any illusions of any of this. What you find is during the decade of the 20s, the money supply kept steadily growing at about a 5 to 6% growth rate per year. Um, and you just didn't see the system-wide collapses, although there was deposit insurance at the state level in like eight, eight states. In each one of those states, those banks failed and every deposit insurance system failed. Uh, so, so. But I, I want to. Cha- I'm trying yeah. to challenge your argument that mm-hmm. that Keynes blames the wrong culprit. Yeah, Keynes, he didn't blame government. Keynes, Keynes should have blamed. You're arguing. Let, let me try to restate it. The failure of the bank as coordinator of savings and and of borrowing and lending collapses in the Great Depression. Keynes blames that on. Animal spirits, the price system failing, etc. You're suggesting the price system failed because the Fed, and this is Friedman and Schwartz. Mm-hmm. There's nothing controversial about this this claim right. that the that the Fed could have averted it. But 
I want to get to your deeper point to me, which is that if we didn't have fractional reserve banking and we didn't have um, monopoly control of the money supply from the federal government, that that would be – that more competitive world would be a more stable world and wouldn't have to rely on these lender of last resort mm-hmm. arguments. But my – so my challenge is, is that in the pre-Fed days when we did not have a Federal Reserve, mm-hmm. we didn't have that monopoly – you still did have instability in the banking system. Now, in the 20s, I understand that some of that instability was, as you say, was local, it was small, it wasn't systemically important, but we did have systemically the claim. I don't know the history well enough, but the standard argument I hear is that, sure, it's, uh, the Fed is imperfect, but before the Fed, we had all this instability, and so it's not just the problem with the Fed. It's not just a government policy failure. It's something right. wrong with, with this – the whole institutional system isn't as stable as, as we might expect. Well, there, there's a difference between asking about the interest rate versus the institutional structure. You see, in America, we only had one era of so-called free banking, close to free banking. That was from the end of the Second Bank of the United States up to the Civil War. After the Civil War... Which is... End of the Second Bank of the United States like is roughly 1837, something okay. like that. So 20 years. Yeah. 20 and, and so you have this period, this window here, where you have uh, what's called wildcat banking, free banking. And then when you look at that era, right, and even though it wasn't totally free banking, uh, and, and certainly when you look from Civil War onward, you have a two-track system. National banks under federal regulation, state banks under state regulation – and most of those crises that we like to attribute to the banking system, most of those in economic history, you can actually look at the policies the, the federal government or the national bank regulators did to, to cause those instabilities. So when people say, yeah, yeah, but we had instability before, yeah, it's because of government policies before. It wasn't as if you had laissez-faire. Right. And then you have... The closest we have to laissez-faire, as I like to say, is this wildcat era of free banking. Now, even there, it wasn't totally free banking because there were still branching laws, which most of the problems come from the branching restrictions because you don't allow diversification out of region and so forth. Uh, And you also have states that will put up these unit unit banking laws where you can't have a second one even within the state. Right. So you have inter and intra branching laws. Now, California is a unique state because California didn't have those branching laws, and I talk about that in, in the book, how it, it survived much better on those. When you look at the era of free banking, and I, and I would go to uh, Rolnick and Weber and Rockoff and others, when economic historians go back and look at this, the era of free banking was actually vastly more stable. They had less inflation. They, they, they didn't have any major catastrophic downturns. Uh, the growth rates were much higher than they were even after the Civil War during this period. Uh, and you have a, a huge spread of, of, of financial uh, um, services throughout the, about, throughout the country. Um, when you of course, look it's at a the, relatively small empirical window. It's, that's right. You, that's you right. could say the same thing about the Great Moderation. That proves that the Fed does great. Then all of a sudden, in 2000. Well, s- but see, but see, here's here's, here's the difference. See, in American history, we had this experience, and then when we look at the actual failures under the free banking wildcat era, uh, when you actually look at depositor losses, something like 80 percent of depositor losses came in a handful of states, and those states had a requirement. For anyone who opened a, quote, free bank, that they had to have a certain percentage of their assets in state bonds, in that state's bonds, like Indiana and Michigan. So you can open a bank, but part of your capital that you're putting in here has to be you purchase our government bonds. Now, that's not a free bank, but this is is steered into we will let you open a bank uh, only if you buy our, our debts. Here. And, of course, those states defaulted on their bonds. Um, so when you so actually look at the days, pattern yeah. of it, the, the <laughs> losses in the free banking were, in percentage terms, relative to deposits, not even a fraction of a percent. Then you look at the losses under the Federal Reserve System as a percentage of deposits. 
going from its inception all the way through 1933, and you say it's, it's vastly higher, vastly higher in percentage terms relative to deposits. So when people say this, I, I make the point that free banking was vastly superior, even with what regulations distorting things they had even then was. So, so, so then my point is to go back to then we look at Canada. We can look at other countries, and that's my whole, my whole point is that free trade matters. The smooth hall is not some little sideshow. And free banking matters. The m- money matters. And uh, we have this very f- uh, brittle, rigid system with all the wrong incentives whether it be deposit insurance and moral hazard, we had these branching restrictions, these unit banks, this dual-track regulatory system, some banks in the Fed, some banks out of the Fed. You, you have everything set up that if everything does not go right, you're, 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 it, be, it itself becomes an aggravating factor. And that's why I, you know. So I'm let's talk about, bank. let's talk about, we're, we're I was going to say we're low on time. We're, we're kind of over time, but that's okay because I think this is extremely interesting. But I want to talk about two, two things in closing. One, uh, it's one thing to say, well, Smoot Hawley's magnitude can't be important because trade's unimportant. And you've said relatively unimportant. So you've said, well, wait, yeah, wait a minute. You can't just look at the volume of trade. You've got to look at the impact on the monetary system. So there's still a question of magnitude. Is it plausible? You said, you know, in, in 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 Pittsburgh, it was 17 months. In Detroit, it was three years. So you've got a lot of other stuff going on. How confident mm-hmm. are you? So my first question is, how confident are you that that you really can pin those contractions in banks on Smoot Hawley? And then second, are those magnitudes large enough to explain the contraction in the money supply that was the proximate cause That's that right. Friedman and Schwartz point to, and that you're Sympathetic to I think most economists are. Yeah, start. no, I, I, it's a great question. Uh, when I first started, my original my original thesis was agriculture because that was our large export. But then, as I start doing the research and actually looking at which banks failed where, I mean, it's not just Detroit, it's not just Pittsburgh. Uh, I go through a bunch of other states, like the state of Nevada. Um, there, they're tied to uh, minerals. And, of course, there was a big increase in tariffs against U.S. exports of copper and all kinds of other kinds of minerals, which uh, we actually know how much that state lost in income because of those tariffs. And an entire chain of banks, the Wingfield chain, went down. It was like oh, 12 banks in that state went down, which was like a fourth of all the banks in the state. We know we, we, can, go, we can look in Boise, Idaho, and the banks that failed there. We can look in Toledo, Ohio, the banks that failed there, Chicago, the various banks that failed there, and I kind of go through these, what was kind of leading up to these bank failures. We look around the world, whether it's the Bowdoin credit installed, it's obvious that that's a, a you know a, a a failure because of this. So, so so let's take that as accepted that a lot of banks and fail. To, that I were think tied this to is exports. an interesting this is an interesting research question because I obviously dealt with a handful. But but when you look at those states on agricultural income, it's 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 hugely connected. What we know is agricultural income drops from six billion net net income from six billion to two billion following Smoot Hawley. So that's a real shock. Now the Fed can't replace the real income loss because of just liquidity. There's an insolvency problem that's gonna hit these banks. My only point was to say that insolvency crisis in agricultural banks, other other types of larger city banks and so forth, uh, that, that insolvency, Smoot Hawley has a big thing to play with. But you got to also understand insolvency creates illiquidity as well. Yeah, for sure. So, so, so when, a, when a bank is losing money, it also loses cash flow. And, and the, the problem is, and I make this point, and Anna Schwartz has made this point, that you can't solve a, an insolvency problem with a liquidity solution, yeah. and I and I agree with that. All you can do is use the liquidity yeah. just to grease the wheels, so that way it doesn't become itself an aggravating factor. In other words, the secondary deflation of the monetary implosion that that um, you know the the Fed I I, I do believe could have with monetary prevented. Most of that, not all of it, because some of it's insolvency that 
doesn't matter. Um, those banks went relatively early and quickly. But it's a great research program. I mean, that's, that's you know, I would, I, I would you know, there's 10,421 banks in America to look at. <laughs> and uh, they're different districts, Federal Reserve districts. You can look at, um, you know, there was the call, the failure of the Caldwell & Company a bank system that took 140 banks in uh, Tennessee and Arkansas and Missouri down. 140, they were all tied into one banking system. And of course, uh, it's, it's fascinating on the Caldwell banking system uh, collapsing as well in, in the uh, St. Louis uh, Federal Reserve District. And we, can, we know what those look like. Let me, let's close with uh, what kind of reactions you've gotten to your research. Uh, um, in fact, what, what do other economic historians say about it, and what do the monetarists say about it? Well, I, you know, it's interesting. I've gotten uh, from those who've read it. I, you know, it's, it's it's kind of a boring book, to be honest with you. <laughs> it's it's going to hurt sales, Tom. You don't want to. I know, that. I know, I know. It's, well, it's, let's it's, say it's, it's more detailed. It's not. It's not boring. It's, 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 you have to really like economics to, yeah, okay. and history. Um, you know, usually they'll say, "Oh, I love economics," and then they get into the data, and they're like, "Oh my God, where are you going with all this?" Um, I think it's interesting, but then again, I'm a yeah, well, historian. Yeah. Um, what is fascinating for me, I mean, uh, some of my colleagues have reviewed it and give me very good reviews on it, uh, uh, Rowley and uh, Williams and, uh, uh, and others. Um, I just got a review back on it from uh, um, John Allison, the chairman of BB&T Bank. Mm -hmm. I, I met him uh, a month ago at Mary Washington University at a luncheon. Gave him a copy of the book because I thought, you know, here's You'd a prominent yeah. one, of the, one of the largest bankers in the, in the country, and uh, and so I gave him a copy of the book. And, and in my office, he, he sent me a, a a review, a short review of it, and uh, he said he thinks this is exactly what happened. But what about the what about the? I want to hear about the monitor, which is which is really interesting to me because he's an actual banker. Yeah, he's, well, but he's what, yeah, he's not as much of an economic historian. No, no, have, but he have, is a banker. Have any economic historians who, in the past, have been skeptical of Smoot Hawley? This this, have you this to think originally twice? went out. This originally went out uh, after I wrote it to. Um, I, th I I think it was sent to Elgar Edgar Elgar, right? And the publishing reviewers, house. yeah, publishing house. And the reviewers said publish it, publish it. But one of the reviewers, um, the, the, main, the main criticism they had of it was they weren't sure that the tariff could have had that much effects. You know, they were still kind of in this, yes, it's probably worse than we actually ever uh, econometrically measure. But, but um, it, their main thing was we need to go dig into a lot of these other cities and countries and, and actually look at the banks and why they failed and, you know, bank by bank. By. Yeah, that's true. It's something I, I couldn't do in, in, in this book. This is, I was just trying to connect a couple dots to say, you know, there's two things going on. So, so they didn't dispute the thesis. They said, yeah, there's probably something there. Because I think uh, that's no, what I And that's all I was trying to say is, look, you know, maybe those 1,028 economists that signed that petition probably saw something on the ground we're not seeing here, uh, that maybe we're too far away from it and, we're, and our modeling biases prevent us from seeing that. And my only thing was, look, in my months of research, I came up with this and I start seeing this pattern, and I haven't had anybody dispute that pattern. Um, the the only question is is there other factors? Sure, there's other factors. This is just one one of many. Uh, but but if 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 I'm right on this, that that little sideshow two percent cannot be cannot that can't withstand anymore. People can't can't claim that. It's one thing if you say. And in fact, other moder monetary economists and monetarists, Douglas Irwin. Now Irwin hasn't reviewed this. I need to send it to Irwin. Um, but he made this point, you know, where he said, oh, it's a little 2% job, right? But he says, but the tariff might have had monetary effects. But he left it at that. Mm -hmm. It might have had monetary, which then would have made it much worse. Well, that's kind of what gets me thinking. Well, let's look at the monetary effects. Well, let's hope uh, so, some yeah, other economists start to look a little more closely at it. It's a yeah. very interesting as you say, it's, there's a lot more work to be done, but you've it's covered first, some fascinating first, uh, stuff. Yeah, yeah. My guest today has been Tom Rustici of George Mason University. Tom, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Well, thank you, Russ, and I uh, appreciate being here. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. 
For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.